Okay, this is active filter design lecture 21. In the last class, <coughs> we saw how one might uh, maximize the dynamic range of a given uh, second order filter and the basic idea was the following. We recognized that there could be several solutions for the component values of a filter Yes, come in. All right. So we recognize that there could be several combinations of uh, uh, transconductor values and capacitor values that can result in the same input or output transfer function. Okay, and uh, uh, we were trying to find out if one particular a set of values is any better than other set and uh, I mean as far as we are concerned what is better uh, means something which has a higher dynamic range because we have seen that uh, gaining 3 dB in dynamic range is uh, for the same power is uh, I mean within quotes a very efficient thing to do. Hmm? Normally to increase 3 dB dynamic range you would have to double the power right but by uh, modifying the values of the components and keeping uh, the power the same, if it was possible to increase the dynamic range by 3 dB, it would be great. Put the put in other terms, uh, this means that if you can get a 3 dB dynamic range for less than twice the power, correct, then you are doing a, a very good job of uh, making the design more power efficient. Okay, power efficiency has to always be considered in relation to the dynamic range. It does not make any sense to say, oh, my filter consumes only 2 microwatts, okay, because I, whereas your filter consumes 2 milliwatts. Uh, that does not make any sense in the absence of mention of the dynamic ranges of the two filters. If the two filters have very different dynamic ranges, then uh, it could turn out that even though filter 2, which has 2 milliwatts, uh, seems like a larger power, it could in fact be more power efficient than the 2 microwatt filter because I could take the 2 milliwatt filter, chop it up into a million parts, right, each which consume 2 nanowatts. You understand? The only difference will be the dynamic range of each of these small parts versus the larger one. Hmm? Okay. So, yesterday we saw that by suitable node scaling, right, the uh, and by suitable node scaling, we found that one can actually do a better job of uh, maximizing the dynamic range. Um, and the uh, final result that we got uh, was the following, that you want to make sure that the peaks of the frequency responses at all nodes must, must be the same. And what is the intuition behind the result? Uh, one, it follows that as far as distortion is concerned, right, or rather at uh, as far as the linear ranges of the transconductors are concerned, you want to make sure that the internal nodes swing as much as possible or as small as possible. So, if you do not want anything to distort, you would ideally like to have signal swings inside which are very, very small. On the other hand, if you have very, very small signals inside the network and at the output you want a large voltage, it means that you are taking a small voltage and somehow amplifying it up uh, uh, to get generate the large voltage that you want. And amplification is always a noisy process, so it always makes sense to take a large signal right, to generate what you want rather than work with small internal things. So, that is the intuition. And we saw that in the math also and we where we saw that 
as alpha went on increasing, what happens to the uh, mean square output noise? Decreases. Decrease. Right. So, as far as simply noise is concerned, you want to make alpha as high as possible. Whereas, for distortion, you want to make alpha as low as possible. So, the best situation where you are not having distortion and you are minimizing the noise is when alpha is chosen such that the peaks of the frequency response here right, is such that it occupies the just occupies the linear range of this transconductor and this transconductor. I mean the linear ranges of all the transconductors are identical. So, in other words, you want to make sure that at every node, the peak swing is just enough to occupy the entire linear range of all the transconductors at that node, which is equivalent to saying that the peak signal swings at all the nodes must be the same. Is this clear? While we discuss this only for a second order example, the same thing uh, follows for uh, a higher order filter. So, the procedure would be to cascade these y quads okay, and then node scale every node inside such that the peak signal swings at all nodes remain the same. Okay. This step of filter design is called dynamic range scaling. And please note that this assumes uh, sinusoidal excitation. Okay. The assumption is that the input to this uh, filter is going to be a sinusoid. Uh, I mean, if you had a sinusoid to begin with, then uh, there's, there would be no need to filter at all, is not it? If you put a sinusoid into the filter, you get a sinusoid at the output. The sinusoid has got no information, right? Only when stuff is varying, and I mean, the whole idea that you have is that there is stuff going into the filter which is got where there is some desired component and some undesired component. Uh, but optimization with you know more real world type signals also shows that the answers you get or the dynamic range you get with this uh, uh, thing assuming with this technique assuming that the excitation is a sinusoid uh, is close enough. So, you do not worry about it. Is that clear? So, uh, when you are designing a filter, how will you, what do you think, uh, uh, you know, how, how will you go about this? Let us say you have some transconductors, you are designing a filter, this is uh, now all spice based design. Uh, you simulate the filter, right, then what will you do? How will you scale dynamic range? Let us get through the nuts and bolts of it. Okay. The next thing to do is uh, look at high order uh, low pass filters. For example, let us say you had a fourth order Butterworth low pass filter. Right? And we want to realize this as a cascade of by quads. And what will be the poles of the fourth order Butterworth? The poles will be they will all lie on a circle. So, the whole pi is divided into or 2 pi is divided into how many sectors? 8 sectors. So, uh, each one is going to be how much? 
45 degrees. So, this angle is 22 and half degrees, this is also 22 and a half degrees. Okay. So, the transfer function will be of the form 1 by s square by omega p square plus s by omega p q 1 plus 1, right. times s square by omega p square plus s by omega p q 2 plus 1. Okay. Uh, as you can see, this corresponds to 1 by quad and these poles correspond to another by quad. Which of these two uh, pole pairs has a higher quality factor. The one closer to the geomega axis has got a higher quality factor. So, how does uh, this response look like? So, you have a bi quad 1, let us assume that q 1 is less than q 2. Okay. All right. So, do you think uh, if I plot the magnitude response of q1 of uh, bi quad 1, let me call this bi quad 1, this is bi quad 2. How will the magnitude response of bi quad 1 look like? What be the DC gain? 1. Okay. What will be the gain at omega p? What is the gain at omega p people? all sorts of answers. So, in this particular example, uh, can we figure out if uh, the magnitude response of bi quad 1 is drooping, is maximally flat or peaking? It is drooping and why is that? So, uh, we know already from our study of second order Butterworth filters that for the frequency response to be maximally flat, what must be the quality factor? 1 by root 2. Okay, and that corresponds to 45 degree angle of the uh, pole location with respect to the geomega axis. Now, we see that the angle with respect to the geomega axis for the low q by quad is more than 45 degrees, okay, which means that the quality factor must be lower than 1 by root 2, which means that it must be drooping. And the uh, I guess you can go and find the exact value of the quality factor, but that is not what I am interested in showing here. So, it must be something like this. And as we discussed, the gain at omega p must be, the magnitude of the gain at omega p must be q1. All right. Now, what about s square by omega p square plus s by omega p q 2 plus 1? Okay. This must, this must peak. Okay, why uh, why must it peak? Yeah. So uh, <coughs> one uh, thing is that one way of looking at it is from the pole zero uh, plot, you can see that the quality factor is greater than one by root two. So it must indeed peak. All right. 
another way of looking at it is that we know what the final result must be what is the what is the input output transfer function how does it look like it is maximally flat so if one is drooping the other must peak so that the product is maximally flat so it probably does something like this okay and the product will look maximally flat like this okay so in the pass band you can see that one by quad is drooping other one is peaking so that the compensate in the stop band both of them are falling so the rejection of the of the fourth order structure is basically the products of the reje the uh, rejections of the uh, each of the second order sections and you can see that the pass band is flat and the stop band it falls off now since you have two by quads one can think of two possibilities of ordering the by quads isn't it so one can put by quad 1 first and by quad 2 later or vice versa by quad 2 and by quad 1. Okay. All right. Which do you think makes sense? It could be again that both of them are equivalent, it does not really matter. It could be that the second one, I mean, one choice, one of them is a better choice. Okay, so how many votes for your uh, A? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, do not look at your neighbor, you might be wrong. Huh? 6. Okay, how about B? Okay, only 1. Huh? What about the rest? No comment. Hmm? Okay, uh, since many of you said uh, uh, this is a better, A is a better choice, why is this a better choice? Yeah. Okay, so what he is saying is the following. If I, let me call this inter intermediate node X, okay. Uh, if I followed if I cascaded by quad 2 after by quad 1, what will be the response at node x? It will be drooping, okay. This is omega p, okay. This is response at x, hmm? whereas if I did it the opposite way, Please excuse my poor drawing. Okay. Mega P, this is 1. This is again response at x. What do we notice? We notice that when BQ2 is put first, right, the peak magnitude at at the intermediate, uh, intermediate node is, is higher. So, when we go through our dynamic range scaling step, what will happen? The DC gain will have to come down in order to keep the, please note that the final node, the output of the cascade is the 
maximally flat affair correct so its peak gain is 1 so when we go through our dynamic range scaling step the peak gain of the intermediate node we will end up scaling it such that its peak gain is 1 which means that the dc gain will will reduce okay all right okay now if the dc gain reduces what what is the problem so this is uh, before scaling so after scaling this is what it will look like probably something like this okay this is after Right. Okay. Another way of thinking about it is, what is the uh, peak signal handling capability of uh, this guy when compared to this chap? It has to be lesser simply because the internal node is peaking, uh, you know, to some value, it's, which is uh, cute whatever q2 correct or probably a little more than q2 and uh, uh, so which means that if you want if the uh, linear ranges of all the transconductors are the same if i just simply put bq2 before bq1 what will happen is that bq i mean the input transconductor of bq1 and you know one of the feedback transconductors of bq2 will saturate when their peak amplitudes are equal to the linear range of the, those transconductors, but that voltage is Q times the input voltage. So, you cannot put even though none of the other transconductors will saturate, you cannot put more than 1 by Q2 times the linear range, correct. Whereas, in the biquad uh, ordering on the left, we see that you can go all the way up to 1 volt. Right? If you want to be able to put 1 volt for the BQ2, BQ1 cascade, then one would have to node scale the, the output uh, of BQ2 or the internal node of the cascade such that its peak gain becomes 1 and as we saw yesterday, what does this lead to? This leads to an increase in noise at the output. Do you understand? Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, so what is the, I mean, can you now come up with a thumb rule based on the intuition you got out of this example? Let us say you had, uh, you know, a sixth order filter, right, the BQ1, BQ2, BQ3. So, there are how many orders are possible? 3 into 2 into 1, which is 6 possible orders, okay. And the higher the order of the filter, the number of possible orders will go on increasing. Of course, one can sit and uh, uh, put all this into a computer and figure out the best order. But as a rule of thumb, what do you think this is, this is taught us? Well, uh, increasing order of Q. <coughs> well, okay. Uh, uh, in this particular case, yeah, it is indeed uh, an increasing order of Q. But if you can see. Uh, you know, uh, you step back a little bit and see the big picture, you see that the attempt must be to make every <coughs> internal node not peak, correct. The moment you have a peak, you have a problem, correct. So, the best order or rather a good order to go with would be that order which prevents peaking at internal nodes, okay. So, in other words, the rule of thumb a general strategy if you Is 
prevent or avoid peaking at the outputs of the internal biquads. There may be many ways of doing this. Okay, and uh, you know, uh, people have generally said, okay, you know, whatever man, you choose one, and then go with it, right? Uh, though if you are trying to extract the half last half dB out of the filter, then it actually makes sense to go through, go and you know, permute and do all the permutations, combinations, and measure the mean square output noise, right? So you do all uh, by quad orders, uh, possible orderings, right? Uh, dynamic range scale each one of them. This will ensure that the the peak signals at all internal nodes is the same. Now measure the mean square noise at the output of each one of these orders and pick that order which is the smallest, where the noise output noise is the smallest. And the general strategy, I mean you have seen the intuition why, the moment you have some internal node with a lot of peaking, correct, then what will happen? The signal there will be much larger than the input, which means that you either have to scrunch the input range or you have to dynamic range scale that node to have to reduce its peak output swing, which means that the noise from those noise sources will, will increase. Okay? So either way you lose. So the best thing to be able to do is not to have to if all the peaks, I mean for example if uh, everything remained as uh, roughly kind of flat or had the same peaks to begin with, then this, uh, the, this problem would not arise. Okay? So uh, it is a fairly common thing to uh, uh, what do you call, the general rule of thumb is therefore <coughs> to prevent peaking at internal bikeboard outputs. The question is. Uh, if you now have, let me just, uh, so what uh, somebody was asking was, What will you do? Now, this is the fourth order whatever filter, right? How will you go about dynamic range scaling this character? We have already agreed that this must be the low Q by quad and this must be the high Q by quad. So, the procedure is pretty much the same that we used for the second order section. You run an AC response, right? You will find that uh, at this node it will be something like this. At this node, it is uh, something like this. What will be the response at uh, this node? It will be this response multiplied by the band pass response of BQ2. So, it is probably uh, something like this and the final response is maximally flat. Okay. Uh, this will have a gain of 1 by definition. right? if you have chosen all the uh, these things properly. Uh, the only question is what I mean the peak gain of this in this uh, particular example this is also no. The only thing that we have to worry about is this and this. Okay. So all that we need to do is the alpha with which this has to be scaled is the ratio of 1 to the peak response. Similarly, the alpha with which this has to be scaled is the ratio of 1 to that peak. Okay. So, this can all be done in a single shot. So, you run one sim, right? you find the peaks of the internal nodes and you know the alphas by which each node has to be scaled right? and you can do all the scaling in a single shot because you know that scaling one node does not affect the responses anywhere else. Okay. So, when for example, you scale this by alpha. Right, then this becomes uh, uh, by alpha and this becomes by alpha okay. and uh, again this becomes by beta, this becomes divided by beta. Okay. 
and if you uh, not goof the, uh, the numbers, you will find that once you do this, you will, uh, it is a single shot procedure and there is nothing else to it beyond this. Ah, so, if there is a peak, I mean, let us say, if, you know, uh, for argument's sake, that one even needed to scale the response at this node, right? In this particular example, it does not arise, but let us say it does. Let us say you need to scale this by gamma. What will you do? Yeah, you just now you scale this by gamma and this by gamma and You understand? Okay. So, uh, and this one also must. Okay. So, so this. Uh, sorry, that's all. Does this make sense? All right. So, we have covered uh, the most, uh, all the important points of the uh, of filter design, which is basically the cascade of bicords. How to realize a single bicord using uh, active. LC, I mean active RC, uh, I am sorry, uh, transconductance capacitance techniques. We have figured out why you need to dynamic range scale and how one might do it. And in a high order filter, we figured out what a strategy, a good strategy is to order the bicords. Okay. The next thing to do is what? What do you think we should do next? Yeah. So, uh, the next thing to do is start figuring out how to implement these voltage control current sources using transistors. Okay. And then we figure out that oops, uh, you know, uh, uh, I want GM, I to be GM times V out, but uh, 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 thanks to all the non-idealities in the transistor, uh, the current is uh, uh, only approximately GM times uh, V in, right. There are a whole bunch of non-idealities associated with a real transconductor. What do you think some of those non-idealities could be? One of course is that the output impedance of the transconductor is, I mean saturation is uh, is definitely uh, uh, something that we expect. The other one is that the output impedance is not infinite, okay. The input uh, uh, impedance is not infinite, uh, there is perhaps uh, uh, parasitic capacitance of the input, there could also be a parasitic capacitance of the output. Okay. Uh, pardon? Yeah, the linear range, you know, of course, we made an idealized uh, conception, right? That is perfectly straight line until some over some range and suddenly flattens off. In reality, what do you think it will be? It is probably some smooth curve, okay. We have to figure out how to deal with this, okay. And we have to figure out, uh, first of all, uh, I mean, before we deal with linearity issues, uh, we would like to see what the non-idealities are in the small signal sense itself, correct. So, as we discussed, the problems could be uh, finite output impedance, parasitic input and output capacitances, okay. And it turns out that if you want to generate I equal to Gm times Vi, uh, you know, you know, transistors are inside, so transistors take time to react, okay, does, does, does not mean that you apply a gate source voltage immediately the current comes, right. It takes some time for it to come. In other words, there is, there is a delay between the input voltage and the output current. I mean in uh, more loose terms, uh, I mean rather in loose language there is delay. In more uh, technical terms, there could be extra poles within the, even though you want I to be Gm times V out, I mean I out to be Gm times V in, the true current is I of S is some GM of S times uh, uh, V in of S and depending on how the transistors are hooked up inside, you know, the uh, uh, the GM of S will have, can have poles, zeros, all sorts of stuff. We will have to first uh, figure out what the effect of all these, uh, I mean, we will have to get down to designing these trans, uh, these transconductors with transistors, look at these non-idealities and figure out what the effect of these non-linearities, uh, non-idealities is on, on the performance of the filter. Only then we will be able to go, go, go and figure out how well to design the transconductor, is not it? Okay. So we wanted ideal I equal to uh, Gm times V, we cannot get that. Uh, we got some approximation, I mean some something, 
right we need to know how good to make that in order that the filter response does not suffer. Okay, so, we will continue in the next class.